So, welcome to the fifth Maddingley Lecture. The Maddingley Lectures are the University's Institute of Continuing Education's public lecture series here at Maddingley Hall, new for 2011. I'm Dr. Rebecca Lingwood, the Director of Continuing Education, and first I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our chair for this evening, Dr. Frank Salmon, so that he can then um, introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Simon Thurley, and to chair the questions at the end of the lecture. Dr. Frank Salmon is the head of the History of Art Department here at the University of Cambridge and is university lecturer specialising in English architectural history. Having trained in Cambridge and at the Courtauld Institute of Art, he previously worked at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art at Yale University and prior to that at the University of Manchester. Uh, Frank Salmon is fe Fellow of St John's College, Cambridge and he, his books include the prize-winning Building on Ruins, the Rediscovery of Rome and English Architecture. So just before handing over to Frank Salmon, um, I'd like to remind you that if you have brought your mobile phones with you, um, now's the time to switch them off. So thank you very much. Over to you, Frank. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Rebecca, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome and introduce this evening's speaker, Simon Thurley. Uh, Simon and I were students together at the Courtauld Institute of Art in the 1980s, but when he stands up here in a minute, you will find that hard to believe, because time has treated him much better than it's treated me. <laughs> Simon will be well known to some of you, I'm sure, uh, through his uh, various and, uh, uh, and uh, extensive uh, career as a presenter of architectural history on television. But he's also uh, a remarkable scholar of British architectural history who has produced a series of wonderful books in, in, in really regular, uh, um, uh, regular order. Uh, there was the Royal Palaces of Tudor England, a version of his PhD thesis that came out in 1993, followed by a monograph on Whitehall Palace in 1999. And I'm pleased to tell you, Simon, although that book is rare now and hard to find, I managed to pick up a copy only this afternoon in, in London. So feeling rather pleased with myself today about that. Monograph on Hampton Court in 2003, a wonderful example of uh, how to do that kind of social history of architecture. And most recently, a book on Somerset House, Old Somerset House, in 2009. With that sort of record, uh, you might think that Simon is uh, nothing more than uh, an academic of very high standing. But of course, he is very much more than that. Since uh, 2002, he has been the chief executive of English heritage, prior to which he was director of the Museum of London in 1997 to 2002, and prior to that, shortly after leaving the Courtauld, the curator of historic royal palaces from 1989 onwards. It's an extraordinary career, uh, and one that was rightly recognized in the recent Queen's Birthday Honours List by the award to Dr. Thurley of the CBE. Please join me then in welcoming Dr. Simon Thurley. Thank you and uh, good evening. It's um, rare that I find myself talking about a historical period through which I've lived. Um, but I thought that uh, it might be interesting to reflect a little bit on uh, attitudes, modern political attitudes, to history and heritage. And my story really this, e this evening um, starts in the 1980s, which were a high period for heritage. This, of course, is the period of Brideshead Revisited, of chintzy interiors, an obsession with country houses. It was the heyday of merchant ivory films, chariots of fire, a room with a view. And meanwhile, the National Trust membership, for the first time, hit a million members. Margaret Thatcher herself uh, appointed Quinlan Terry, the classicising architect, to remodel the interiors of 10 Downing Street to make them seem more like the interior of an 18th century town palace, not a plain speculative uh, terraced house. You see, Margaret Thatcher had, I think, seen uh, the arts, heritage and history as a matter of national prestige. I remember when I was director of the Museum of London showing her round the galleries and as we walked through each gallery, she talked about 
our history and the way we beat the French, the Spanish, the Germans, and virtually everyone else. For her, history was real, it was present, and I think it was a defining part of what Britain was to her. In 1983, her government passed the National Heritage Act, a measure that I think typified the Tory attitude to heritage at the time. This wasn't a bill that provided for the protection of buildings, or the protection of monuments, but it was one that created a bureaucracy that would, for the first time, combine all the heritage functions currently ca carried out by the government in a semi-autonomous body, or quango, as we know them today. English heritage was, in fact, the brainchild of Michael Heseltine, who, by creating it at a stroke, reduced the apparent size of the civil service by a 1,000 people. The 1983 Act was about efficient, cost-effective management. It was about exploiting the commercial potential of historic properties in state care. It was about efficiency and presentation, not about preservation. And this, I think, very business-like attitude to heritage was part of a general industrialization of the society and of the economy. It was in these years that the tourist industry was found, the leisure industry was created, and of course, the heritage industry was invented. And it was the heritage industry that was attacked by Robert Hewison in his 1987 book, The Heritage Industry, Britain in a Climate of Decline, with this wonderful uh, cover, which I show you here, with uh, Britain in the shape of a dodo. Hewson argued that with everything real in Britain, now either uh, defunct or in terminal decline, the only thing that we had left to sell to the world was a manufactured image of our past. Hewson, uh, a left-wing historian still very much around, I think was ahead of his time, because this was precisely the accusation that was to be levelled at Britain by New Labour a decade later. But I'll come on to this uh, in a few minutes. The conservative industrialization of culture continued immediately after the 1992 election with John Major's creation of a new Department of State, the Department of National Heritage. The DNH, as it became known, was created with exactly the same objectives as English heritage had been. It was a way of properly managing and making accountable a group of broadly similar activities. In fact, in 1992, the national heritage, which included museums, galleries, sport and the media, was effectively made into a new state-run industry. But 1992 was also the year that John Major launched a consultation on raising money for good causes through a national lottery. And this led in 1993 to the Lottery Act, and in 1994 to the creation of the Heritage Lottery Fund, one of the four good causes to be funded from lottery receipts. In 15 years, it has dispersed one and a half billion pounds to 12,800 historic buildings and monuments. And the creation of this fund was, I think, without any argument, the single most important heritage decision of the last 30 years. So for John Major, history was important too. But his vision of England was a much more domestic vision than Mrs. Thatcher's. It was much less about kings and queens and victory and defeat. In a speech that he gave uh, in St. on St. George's Day in 1993, he spoke of his image of England in the following terms, and I quote from it. The long shadows falling across the county ground, the warm beer, the invincible green suburbs, the dog lovers and pools fillers, old maids bicycling to Holy Communion through the morning mist. But... In 1993, this was far from many people's experience. Few old maids would have felt safe bicycling anywhere, especially, I think, in the mist. Tony Blair, unlike his 
two immediate predecessors was not interested in history, let alone heritage. The November after his election, the new Prime Minister received Jacques Chirac, the French president, uh, on a state visit to London. Rupert Cornwall wrote in the independent newspaper, and I quote, Brash new Britain knows no bounds, as Jacques Chirac will discover on Friday. This week's Franco-British summit will not be held at fuddy-duddy Downing Street or that heritage theme park Chequers. No, it's the blooming Docklands for the French president. <laughs> you may remember it. Indeed it was. Tony Blair had asked Terence Conran to decorate the 38th floor of the Canary Wharf Tower for the occasion. Chirac said, perhaps with a hint of irony, well, this gives an image of a young, dynamic, modern England. I like it. Not a very good French accent, but that's what he said. <laughs> and Alistair Campbell perhaps said, result. Because this, of course, was part of the much derided Cool Britannia. But we shouldn't ever forget that Cool Britannia actually had an intellectual underpinning, a pamphlet called Britain TM, written by Mark Leonard and published by Demos in 1997. Chris, now Lord Smith, who was eventually to enter the cabinet as the man in charge of heritage, said, and I quote, the recent Demos work is frightening in the evidence it amasses about the way in which we as a nation look backwards. The Demos authors dryly tell us that Britain's image remains stuck in the past. Britain is seen as a backward-looking has-been, a theme park world of royal pageantry and rolling green hills. This, if you remember, was the message that Robert Hewison had started to preach in 1987. Peter Mandelson, speaking at the launch of the Dome, had the solution. The shift we need to make, he said, is from defining ourselves from, by our past to defining ourselves by our future. And this is precisely what the Millennium Dome set out to do with its single-minded concentration on the future and no mention of Britain's long and important past. Yet, you know, in some ways, I think that it could be argued that this was not just a political fad. It was part of a zeitgeist. For the huge interest in heritage during the 1980s and the 1990s was beginning to burn out. As the millennium neared, there was a general forward-looking feeling, and attendance at heritage sites took a nosedive. Now, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, what you're meant to be looking at here is uh, various types of things that people do in their leisure time, and the bottom line, which is the, the purple line, shows how, as the millennium neared, the popularity of visiting heritage sites um, took a very significant uh, and obvious dip. Now, it has to be said that there are a number of factors that probably caused this decline. There was foot and mouth disease that came in 2001, which closed large parts of the countryside, driving tourists away. There was uh, the rise of cheap air travel. EasyJet was founded in 1995, suddenly making it cheaper to fly to Malaga than to get a train to Penzance. The previous year, uh, shopping had been legalized on Sundays, and the day that was previously reserved for family trip, trips out uh, were then used for trips to the high street. And in 2000, a whole host of new visitor attractions opened to celebrate the millennium. And very importantly, in December 2001, national museums in London became free. So the consequence of all these things, together with this, this sort of zeitgeist, meant that 2000 was very much a sort of high watermark for the heritage industry, um, and the years since then have seen quite a steep decline. So in this climate of hostility to the past and a decline in visits to paid her heritage sites, what was new Labour's policy to, heri um, to heritage actually going to be? Well, um, in 1995, as leader of the opposition, 
Tony Blair had been to Australia, as we now know, because it's in the papers um, almost every single day. Uh, and in Australia, he had been impressed by the Labour Prime Minister, Paul Keating's cultural policy, which was called Creative Nation. Yes, Australia does have a cultural policy. Um, now, Creative Nation had as its essence the commodification of culture, so that its economic and social impact could be measured and then selectively and scientifically supported by the state to boost the national economy. Culture, henceforth, was to become the creative industries. And when Blair got back to Britain, the Shadow Secretary of State, who was then Jack Cunningham, was asked to look at copying Australia's big idea for culture. Cunningham didn't get the job in 1997. It was handed to the former Secretary of State, uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Health, Chris Smith. And it was his job to implement the Australian creative nation uh, ideas in Britain. So after uh, New Labour's massive win in 1997, the Department of National Heritage was renamed the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, the DCMS, and given this elegant logo. This was not only a rebranding, because it represented a genuine change of direction. Heritage was associated with 18 years of Tory power. It was associated with John Major's old maids riding their bicycles to communion. It was associated with Brideshead Revisited, a lost English world of privilege and wealth, the physical manifestation of the establishment that new Labour wished to dismantle. Heritage played precisely no part in the vision of the new department. Chris Smith published his pamphlet, uh, A New Cultural Framework, in 1998, the policy for his new department, which explained that what were now rebranded as the creative industries were a new growth sector in the economy, both nationally and globally, and against a decline in traditional manufacturing industries were a future source of employment and wealth creation. This world where heritage was reduced to a money-making theme park was satirized in Julian Barnes's book, England, England. This novel, you may have read it, futuristic novel, published only the year after New Labour came into power. The grotesque but visionary tycoon, Sir Jack Pittman, spotted the money-making potential of England's heritage. But he realized that people were rather put off by the inconvenience of actually having to travel to see it. So, starting from the premise that tourists are only interested in the top attractions and are basically as satisfied with replicas as the real thing, he set out to rebuild all the main heritage attractions of England on the Isle of Wight. And there, replicas of everything, from Buckingham Palace to Stonehenge, from Wembley Stadium to White Cliffs of Dover are reconstructed. And when uh, Sir Jack was asked uh, how the inhabitants would react to his plans, he replies in the book, it's not full of inhabitants. What it's full of is future grateful employees. <laughs> so Chris Smith's uh, priorities were reflected in government spending. Over a five-year period, from 2000, the DCMS poured money into museums, 36% increase. This was obviously mainly to make them free. It deluged money into the arts, 53% increase. This is contemporary art. And they flooded sport with new funding, a 98% increase. As the former, um, uh, and you can see here on, on the screen, uh, it's pretty um, obvious, you can see the vast increase and sport, and obviously these tiny ones down here uh, at the bottom are what happened to, um, to, to heritage. Um, the Heritage Lottery Fund suffered too. Money was taken out of the Heritage Lottery Fund for a number of other good causes. And you can see this is uh, the amount of money available to the Heritage Lottery Fund 
which was uh, gradually raided uh, and finally raided very, very heavily, of course, for the Olympics, for sport. In comparison to other branches of culture or to the planning system or to education or even to the countryside, the financial picture for heritage was very bleak from 1997. So was this attitude to heritage at best indifferent or at worst actively hostile a new one for the Labour Party? Well, if you look back at the heritage legislation that was passed over the 20th century, you will see that almost all of it was passed by either Liberal or Labour governments. This is just a simple list I just pulled out of all the acts of uh, heritage protection from uh, the first Ancient Monuments Protection Act right the way up to the Ancient Monuments uh, and Archaeological um, Areas Amendment Act of 1979. Uh, and you can see the majority of them uh, are uh, either red or um, uh, uh, yellow, which are Liberal or, um, or, or, or Labour um, Acts of Parliament. Um, only one of the major heritage conservation acts was passed by a Conservative government, and that was by the uh, wartime uh, coalition um, of uh, Winston um, Churchill. Um, and that was the, 1990, uh, the 1944 Act that um, essentially um, created uh, the listing system. So I think it is possible to argue that the conservation of England's heritage was deep in Labour's bones. And the one type of history that the 1997 Labour government was interested in was their own. So why apparently abandon it? Well, I think to understand the, um, this point, we need to uh, look back at the genesis of heritage conservation in England uh, um, in, a, in a sort of hi historical sense. And to do that, I think we need to look much more closely at the parliamentary debates that accompanied these bills. And when we do that, we see that in not one single case was the conservation of heritage a government priority, and in many cases, it wasn't even a government concern. In fact, in every single case, conservation provisions were either slipped into existing measures by determined individuals, or they were introduced afresh as private members' bills. The very first act of 1882, uh, which was uh, uh, sponsored by Sir John Lubbock, who you see here, which protected ancient monuments, uh, was entirely his personal uh, 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 mission. Um, his personal sponsorship of the bill basically came to characterize the way heritage legislation in England developed. Just one example out of many I could give you uh, is the way the 1967 Civic Amenity Acts took place. Now, this was the act that created the power for local authorities to create conservation areas. Incredibly important act of parliament. It was passed by Harold Wilson's first ministry. And we know a great deal of the genesis of this act as its passage is recorded in two books. The first is the diary of Richard Crossman, who became the Minister of Housing and Local Government after the 1964 election. And the other is the memoir of his junior minister after 1966, Wayland Kennett, Lord Kennett, who wrote this memoir here called Preservation. Crossman's diary records a visit that he made in May 1965 to Newcastle. He visited Eldon Square, perhaps the city's finest Georgian square, then earmarked for demolition and replacement by a shopping centre. He wrote in his diary, I blew up our regional staff in Newcastle and told them that they were vandals for giving my consent. But I knew that it was already a fait accompli, and that when I get back to the department, I shall force to, be di to draft the directive letter saying that they should have permission. This uh, event stimulated Crossman's desire to do something to protect historic towns that were, at that moment, under huge threat of redevelopment. Crossman set out brigading all the powers for listing and grants into his own department. And then he pursued a bill that would no, not only protect individual buildings, as of course listing had done, but protect whole historic townscapes. The civil servants did everything they could 
to stop him. In his diary, he wrote that the permanent secretary proudly, proudly and I, I quote, counted himself a modern iconoclast, believing that there was a clear-cut conflict between modern planning and reactionary preservation. Well, Crossman and Kennett teamed up with the Conservative MP and former Housing Minister Duncan Sandys, who'd drawn first place in the ballot for private members' bills. And between them, they ultimately agreed on a bill for the protection of what was described as neighbourhood amenity by the designation of conservation areas. And this was passed into law in 1967. Our heritage system thus came about not due to carefully thought out government policy, but as a result of determined and sometimes subversive efforts of individual MPs and ministers. And so in reality, in 1997, neither New Labour nor the Tories had any tradition of introducing heritage legislation. Yet Chris Smith did realise that heritage needed some sort of policy. And he commissioned Sunil Cussons, then the chairman of English Heritage, to review heritage and come up with a policy. And this he did in 2000. It was a document called The Power of Place, the future of the historic environment. There's no doubt that this was a very important report. And it too, like the Labour Party in 1997, rejected the word heritage. Heritage was now rebranded the historic environment, a much less emotive and loaded phrase, and one which set heritage as part of a much wider and more complex environment in which we all live. It recognised that as part of the wider context of our lives, it shouldn't just affect cultural policy, but it should be part of those branches of government that affect the places in which we live. But power of place and the government response to it, which was called a force to our future, of course, nicknamed by its initials AFOF or FOF, um, had little discernible um, effect on planning policy, apart from some vague policies for uh, some legislation when time allowed. Heritage in the early 2000s was politically still seen as a blockage, as a retrospective and inhibiting force in society. But in 2003, there came a turning point. John Prescott, remember him? Uh, the then uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, who had a whole office named after him, uh, became responsible for regeneration and responsible for planning. And he suddenly realized that heritage mattered. And this all came about through the case of Nelson. Nelson was a small Lancashire mill town which I show you here. And to explain the case of Nelson, I need to take a few steps back. In the late 1990s, uh, an academic at Birmingham University called Brendan Niven produced a series of papers on areas of rundown inner city housing in the Midlands and the North, where the value of properties had fallen so low um, as you could buy a house for a couple of quid. He suggested that if these Victorian and Edwardian houses were demolished and replaced with modern buildings attractive to higher income residents, those people might move back from the suburbs into the inner cities, bringing eco economic and social revitalization. And these ideas found favor first in the treasury and then in the office of the deputy prime minister, which was responsible for housing and regeneration. And it led to a program that was launched in 2002 known as Housing Market Renewal Pathfinder. This catchy term, this was a multi billion pound program to tackle nine geographical areas in the Midlands and the North, comprising about 850,000 uh, rundown houses. Now, as these uh, proposals were being formulated, uh, other proposals were being drawn up for large-scale clearance in this town, Nelson. More specifically, in Whitefield, 
the most complete Victorian townscape in Pennine, Lancashire, with a mix of houses, uh, mills, uh, weaving sheds, the church, the school, and all integrated together with the canal. The majority of the buildings dated between 1860 and 1890. But the decline of the textile industry from the 1960s uh, was accompanied by uh, the employment of skilled workers from Pakistan and Bangladesh. So that the, by the 2000s, the area had a 90% ethnic minority population. Many of these people were unemployed, and despite the fact that uh, almost all the houses were privately owned, the, the uh, whole area was extremely poor. The local council, Pendle, proposed to demolish a third of the houses in Whitefield and replace them with new housing, uh, and uh, then they were going to uh, refurbish um, the third of the old houses that remained. Initially, it was uh, proposed to demolish 400 houses, and as part of this process, compulsory purchase orders were served on 162 of them. And what you see here is uh, some of the 162 that uh, compulsory purchase orders were um, levied on, and here you see uh, what the effect of that was on the area, because the moment they were uh, bought, the council um, boarded them up. The local people and English heritage were very unhappy. We believed that Pendle had deliberately redrawn the boundary of the conservation area in such a way to exclude the best parts of the town, which as a consequence would not be protected. English Heritage called for a public inquiry. It sat for 11 days, and the inspector decided in August 2002 that English Heritage's case for refurbishing the houses, rather than simply demolishing them, should be upheld. John Prescott thought differently. By then, he had uh, published the details of the housing market renewal plans and had designated this part of East Lancashire as one of his pathfinder areas. And obviously, the arguments at Nelson about the viability of Victorian uh, terraces went to the heart of government policy. And so the inspector's report was rejected and he was asked to reopen the inquiry in the light of the government's proposals and particularly the evidence from the academics um, who underpinned um, the, uh, the, the research that underpinned them. So the inquiry sat again in February and March 2003 amidst a huge amount of publicity and intense political scrutiny. When the inspector reported again in September 2003, he asked the Secretary of State not to confirm Pendle's application for compulsory purchase on the grounds that he had, they had paid insufficient regard to the area's architectural and historical interest. He also said that the repair of the homes would be cheaper than clearance and redevelopment. Well, as you can imagine, the government had very little choice but to accept these recommendations. And since then, parts of Whitefield have, in fact, been refurbished. Although, it should be said, the arguments there are still far from over. But the battle for Nelson was extremely important because it showed in stark terms that restoring heritage, rather than demolishing it, could regenerate declining places more effectively and more economically than clearance and new build. One of the big features of the Nelson campaign had been the vocal and integral part that local residents had played in defending their town. Popular protest and then participation in thinking about alternative solutions had made a big mark on the government and had made a big mark on English heritage. And English heritage decided to capitalise on this by turning the whole thing into a big television event. As the Nelson, Nelson public inquiries were being fought, together with Jane Root, the controller of BBC Two, English Heritage dreamt up a programme called Restoration. It was developed with Peter Bazalgette, 
the inventor and owner of Channel 4's reality show, Big Brother. The concept was for English Heritage to identify 30 buildings at risk and then get the public to vote on the one that should be saved. The winner would get money from English Heritage and the Heritage Lottery Fund. The first series went out in summer 2003, and the first winner was the spectacular but crumbling Victorian Manchester Baths. It was such a success that the BBC re-ran the series twice more. Restoration demonstrated, if it was needed, that restoring and reusing historic buildings was not only an economically advantageous way of regenerating places, it was deeply popular. In fact, Nelson and restoration between them really revealed the gulf between the official and the unofficial view of Britain. The British people by this stage were living a double life. The old Britain, an old country with a long history where people loved their built heritage, was the unofficial country where people actually lived. Then there was the official rebranded Britain, its modern counterpart, which only really existed amongst the tiny metropolitan political elite who invented it. And these two nations were still reflected in cultural policy. In heritage terms, most people valued their towns and villages, the countryside and cityscapes, because it made them feel good, because they were beautiful, because they were awesome, because they had historical resonance, because they made places more interesting and more characterful. Politicians, it seemed, valued them for their economic and social contributions, the way historic places levered in private investment, the way historic places added value to the balance sheet of property companies, the way they might contribute to the amelioration of deprivation and social disadvantage. In 2000, uh, the document I talked about before, Power of Place, started to argue from the former position, from the uh, economic position, commissioning uh, from Mori a survey that demonstrated that 87% of the population believed that protecting historic places was important and that 77% of people disagreed that, as a society, Britain protected too much. But within three years, heritage bodies had come together to start gathering the hard data that they hoped would prove to government that heritage was worth funding. Realising that uh, the instrumental approach was here to stay and led by English Heritage, they launched an annual survey called Heritage Counts, which set out to capture hard data to demonstrate in economic terms just what a powerful contribution heritage made to society. Well, after seven years in power, um, there began to be signs that the Labour policy towards culture might be shifting. In 2004, Tessa Jowell, Chris Smith's uh, successor as Secretary of State, published an essay looking at the relationship between government and the bodies in her department. In it, she wrote the following. Too often, politicians have been forced to debate culture in terms of only its instrumental benefits to other agendas and we need to find a way to demonstrate the personal and value added which comes from engagement with culture. Well, Tessa Dat Jowell never managed to translate these views into policy, perhaps partly because of the force of Treasury opinion against her. But her successor had the potential to be much more successful. In June 2007, James Pennell became DCMS Secretary of State. And from his very first day, he rejected the whole instrumentalist notion for measuring cultural activity. In his second month in power, he asked uh, Sir Brian McMaster, the former director of the Edinburgh International Festival, to undertake a review to see how it might be possible to move the discussion about public subsidy from measurement, 
to judgment, from a culture of target setting to a new emphasis on excellence. In January 2008, McMaster reported. The same month, Purnell was reshuffled to the Department of Work and Pensions, and the report was binned. What I think this shows is that although Labour policy on heritage uh, remained solidly instrumentalist since 1997, both of Chris Smith's immediate successors, Jal and Purnell, were in fact searching for a policy that would recognize more fully the, the, the contribution that culture made to society. Well, of course, now, strangely, the Labour administration seems 100 years ago. Since then, uh, public services have been severely cut and a uh, political uh, uh, philosophy adopted that aims to see cultural bodies moved out of state control into the third sector. In the cultural sphere, the coalition is entirely Tory. There are no liberal ministers. So what does the new generation of Tories think about heritage? Well, under Jeremy Hunt, his uh, junior minister, John Penrose, deliberately elected to take the title heritage minister. And at his first official engagement, the opening of the uh, gardens at uh, Chiswick House in West London, he said loudly and clearly that heritage was important because of what it was, not of because what it did for the national balance sheet. However, with the overriding aim of the government being the reduction of the deficit, the difficulty of redefining the value of culture is a huge challenge. When the price paid by society for the horrors of cancer is given a monetary value by the Treasury, how can the Secretary of State for Culture try and argue that his area should be exempt from cuts? He didn't win. Heritage was cut by 35% um, only uh, 10 months ago. But let's look into a crystal ball for a few minutes. Let's look beyond the cost-cutting and the quango bashing that's dominated uh, politics for the past um, 18 months to two years. How will heritage be seen over the next five years? Well, first of all, the credit crunch has seen, uh, I think, a different attitude to the way we live our lives. And this, of course, is still uh, something that is uh, changing as I speak. People, I think, have been much less obs obsessed with short-term spend, spend, and I think a new spirit of make, do, and mend is discernible. A new age of austerity, perhaps. People are looking to things that are reliable, things that are permanent, tried, and tested. History and heritage are undoubtedly on their way back. People are going abroad on their holidays much less. People are holidaying at home. The certainties of the last 10 years are now being completely eroded, and something else is taking its place. This is uh, what is happening to um, heritage visits. Um, and uh, hopefully you can uh, see, uh, this is just the English heritage data. Um, uh, the same has happened not only to English Heritage, but uh, to the National Trust um, and to uh, all uh, heritage uh, attraction operators. Um, all, of, all of them have had their best years ever um, and have staged a recovery uh, above and beyond the pre-2000 years. So that's the first point. Um, how long that will last, we don't know, but um, it is a very, very strong trend and it is continuing this year. Secondly, I think that this evening's story tells a heartening and positive tale about the, our parliamentary system. Heritage protection has never been a primary or even a secondary concern of governments. The protection that we have in this country has been the work of individual politicians who were determined to protect the places that were precious to them and their constituencies. And I believe that this will continue to be the case. It's incredibly unlikely that heritage policy will ever be a vote winner, but the passion of individual politicians will continue to safeguard 
the country's long history. But what of the government's intentions? Well, I think there are two things uh, to note. The first is the emphasis on localism, on the power of local people to determine their environments. This must be, surely, a good thing for heritage, as most people are inherently conservative in their outlook on their surroundings. For many, this might just mean that their post office or their pub is saved, and for others, that a new housing estate is not built on the edge of their town. But there is a deep ambiguity here, too. The government is obsessed with economic development, and relaxing the planning system is one of the pledges they've given to business. At this very moment, a planning bill is going through Parliament, and the tensions between localism and economic growth are being thrashed out. But what's really interesting to me is that all the main parties are now very concerned about energy efficiency and carbon reduction. And this, I think, will play a really important part in discussions about heritage in the next few years. Everyone in this room will, where possible, I guess, recycle their aluminium cans. Here is a typical terraced house. Let's say uh, that one of these houses here is demolished to build a new one. In demolishing it, we will have wiped out the entire environmental benefit of the last 1,344,000 aluminium cans that we recycled. And this is because the embodied energy in these buildings has got to be considered in calculating the pros and cons of demolishing buildings. A standing terraced house like one of those contains the equivalent of about 212,000 litres of petrol in embodied energy. That is enough to drive a car around the world more than once. And when that house is turned down, all that energy is wasted, and the new so-called energy-efficient replacement will take between 30 and 50 years to recover the carbon expended on constructing it. It may be that arguments for keeping old buildings will shift from the old ground of historical and architectural value and will increasingly revolve around sustainability. These may, in fact, be the new arguments for heritage for the new age of austerity. Perhaps the economic bust will mean a heritage boom, but of course, only time will tell. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. I don't think anybody could have given us such a magisterial overview of what's been going on in the past two decades and indeed this uh, intriguing insight that you end with as to what will perhaps happen in the next five years or so. There is an opportunity for questions to be had from the floor. I think you're willing to, to take some. But just, just before we perhaps take a question, I wonder if I could ask you a little bit, because having noticed that... Um, much of what you call the instrumentalization of labor policy towards heritage coincided with your own arrival at English Heritage in 2002. How did you negotiate that, that situation where you must have found yourself in effectively quite a lot of disagreement with, with ministers who ultimately were bankrolling your organization? That must be a very difficult situation to negotiate. Well, of course, what we tried to do was um, fight science with science. And uh, we spent a huge amount of time and money trying to monetize the benefits of heritage. And the whole cu cultural sector was doing it. I mean, the, the opera house was trying to do it. The um, you know, regional theaters were trying to do it. The cathedrals uh, you know, uh, commissioned a big report to show what the economic benefits of having a cathedral in your city were. Um, and so everyone was at it. Everyone was trying to uh, monetize the, the value of what they were doing. But of course, ultimately, it was an utterly, utterly futile activity. Because uh, whatever the uh, uh, monetary benefits of uh, a cathedral would be, um, the government were getting those benefits anyway. Mm. The government didn't need to contribute any money to it. The cathedral was never going to fall down. No one would let it, because everyone was going to give money to it. And so it, it wasn't a way for, of, of opening the, the, the checkbook 
of the culture department or indeed of the, um, of the, uh, of the treasury. And so uh, I think that is why even the Secretary of, Secretaries of State realized that there had to be another way of doing it. And the McMaster's review, I think if it had come out and it had been published and been acted on, yeah. would have provided a new platform for it. Yeah. But of course, in a sense now, all those arguments are just worthless because there is no money. Um, and uh, what will be very interesting is if there is ever any money ever again, you know, what will be the arguments? And that's why I you know, just fly a kite of what the arguments might be um, in, in a fantasy world where the world isn't broke. But they do come back again on issues of sustainability and measurability. Absolutely. Yes, they must do. Yes. Well, if there are questions from the floor, I'm sure Simon would be happy to take them. We do have, I think, a microphone that would go around to a questioner. And if I could ask you, if you do want to ask a question, to just wait until the microphone is with you, because we are actually also webcasting the occasion to colleagues in another room. So they won't hear your question unless you wait for the microphone to come. So would anybody like to put a question to Simon Thurley? It's one at the front here. If you just wait for the microphone to come, that would be great. Thank you. Is there any fundamental difference in the nature of the properties of English heritage and the National Trust? Uh, uh, yes, uh, there, is, there are several fundamental dif differences. I mean, the, um, the government started, um, if you like, collecting ancient monuments and historic buildings um, in 1883. Um, the original schedule of ancient monuments, in which there were six, 68 monuments, were collected by the government between 1883 and 1913. In 1913, there was an act passed um, which set the, uh, the, the inspectorate of ancient monuments on the process of gathering together uh, what they considered to be the, the most important monuments of English history uh, into, into state care, into, into state guardianship. And by, um, by 1945, over 360 monuments had been taken into care by the state. Uh, at that point, the National Trust had been founded, but it did not uh, have as a major part of its activity taking on historic buildings. It was mainly concerned with the protection of the countryside. Uh, but after the war, the government realized that it was going to have to do something about country houses that were falling into peril. Uh, the first country house that fell into peril was Audley End House, which uh, the government just wrote out a check for and bought, and it went into the care of the Ministry of Works, but it was very, very quickly realised that there was no way that the government could ever uh, deal with the country house problem. And that is why the country house scheme with the National Trust was set up, an Act of Parliament was passed, um, and when Blickling Hall became the first country house that the National Trust took, it relieved the government from the necessity to carry on its collecting policy uh, with uh, country houses. And therefore, the sort of fundamental difference between the National Trust and English Heritage is that the, the English Heritage collection was really all amassed before the war. It was amassed on a pretty scientific basis with uh, inspectors of ancient monuments having lists of things they wanted to acquire, which were the buildings that they regarded to be as the great historical monuments of the nation. But after the war, they realized that this just couldn't go on. It was financially unsupportable. And essentially, the National Trust took on the next bit chronologically. Um, uh, the the story is a little bit more complicated by that, but that is the essential difference between the two um, collections, if you like. And of course, what it gives uh, um, England and, and the UK is it, this absolutely unique collection of things which are held in trust either by uh, the Secretary of State or by the National Trust for the Nation. I mean, very few countries are as lucky as we have to have this extraordinary number of buildings which are safeguarded um, uh, in the National Trust words forever for everyone. Is there another question? Just to hear. Uh, I think the lady first. Hi, I was very interested by what you said about um, energy efficiency and uh, the new build and the 30 to 50 years um, to make up for tearing down and rebuilding terrace houses like this. I was wondering, does that, do you know if that includes, if that's the houses as they are now or if that kind of, even if you refitted certain aspects and, and added new energy kind of um, insulation in and things like that, would that even extend that, that period even further? 
Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a very hot topic at the moment. In fact, um, a government minister was sounding off about, uh, about it today, saying, you know, the answer to the energy problem is insulating your houses. Um, and uh, the, the whole business of giving every house an energy rating um, is an incredibly crude and blunt instrument. And we've had quite a lot of arguments uh, with the government over the system that essentially marks down an old house um, just because it's old. And I think the prob a lot of the problem has been um, a fundamental lack of uh, research and data on the energy performance of old houses. And of course, what we have to remember is that most of these Victorian houses were built in an age which was, by definition, a low-carbon age. You know, energy was uh, the thing that uh, was rarest and most important, and to keep warm was a you know, vitally important um, activity. So English Heritage has been doing a lot of research, a lot of technical research, to uh, demonstrate, to prove um, that uh, um, old houses can, with relative ease, be made to um, meet and, in fact, exceed um, modern um, energy requirements. And we've got a big chunk of our website that argues this through. And, in fact, at this very moment, we are doing an experiment with a terraced house that is um, wired up with... Um, thermometers and diodes and geodes and all sorts of other odes um, <laughs> plugged into computers um, to monitor very, very minutely all of this on a totally scientific basis so that we can go back um, and um, argue against some of the, the things. And, and some of the things that we're arguing against are very difficult to argue against. I mean, the plastic window industry, who are in a sense, it's a sort of St. George and the Dragon, the, the windows of the Dragon and English Heritage of St. George, just hasten to add, um, that you know, these windows, the amount of carbon that is expended in making the windows will never be recovered in their lifetime. And you know, the, the thought that you're taking out sustainable windows that are made of wood and chucking them away and replacing them by windows that take a huge amount of energy to create oil, to create the plastic, and very, very high temperatures to, to make the glass you know, is madness, and we've got to argue against it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Graham Anthony. Uh, I tend to look uh, on the optimistic side. I've just come back from a tour of St Pancras, uh, surely one of the great triumphs of restoration. Uh, but I'm very confused. We recently spent a few days down at Poundbury, next to Dorchester, Prince Charles Pet Project. And I've got to say, we love it. Loved it down there. Um, my architect friends, tell me that's all a load of rubbish and we should be using all these modern materials. If you look at Canary Wharf, it started off, in my opinion, beautifully with traditional materials. It's now gone on to horrible modern materials. So I'm confused, and I think the whole nation is confused by really what is beauty, what is heritage, what is worth conserving. But I'd particularly like you to say a few words about Poundbury. Uh, okay. Um, well, the arch architects hate, hate Poundbury um, because uh, uh, um, they uh, had a big falling out with the Prince of Wales who criticised them, and he criticised them uh, at a moment where, they, uh, where the criticism was actually very legitimate. The public were utterly dazed and confused and... Uh, flabbergasted, really, by what architects were doing. There was a, a huge rift through uh, between you know, society and the architectural profession. I mean, if you think of the, the whole process of modernism after the war, I mean, from really from the late 60s, going through the 70s and 80s, and going through brutalism and everything, I, I just don't think the public understood what was going on. I mean, to everybody, it was ugly and it was horrific. And Something that I think is almost unique in English architectural history happened, and Frank will go correct me or kick me under the table if he's wrong. I mean, most previous styles were brought down by the sort of the, the sneers and the mockery of connoisseurs. You know, modernism and brutalism were brought down by the absolute revulsion by the general public of what was being built. And I think the, pub, the architects are still in the process of trying to rebuild a, a relationship with the general public. And that relationship um, is actually an aesthetic relationship. Um, as much as anything else. And into that relationship comes the, the issue of materials, and I think the issue of materials is going to be um, fundamentally linked 
to the issues of sustainability. I mean, the thought that you can carry on building buildings that are completely of glass um, in, a, you know, in a world where you know, energy uh, use is going to be the dominating factor, a building that can only work if you have the air conditioning running day and night all, all year long, how can that be right? It just can't be. And I think that the, the gross um, shard of glass in London, which is an utterly repulsive building, that is, is going up in, on top of uh, London Bridge Station at the moment, will be the last of, of these things. And is, you know, quite often you get the most sort of repulsive final thing before the, the tide turns. And I just can't see how people can justify creating buildings that take so much carbon to make and then so much carbon to run. And that, of course, will be linked with style. And I think it will make some very, very big changes in the next few years. But that's my prediction. And invite me back in five years' time, ten years' time, and we'll see whether I'm right or not. I think I'm right in saying, Simon, aren't I, that the, uh, the shard was actually uh, disapproved of by English heritage, yeah. but uh, nonetheless went ahead. So there's a political dimension as well as to, to the will to, to take the advice of the, of the expert um, authority. So I think we probably ought to take may a... I, may I just... Sure. Follow that up because architects design the buildings. Local <coughs> councillors elected by us approve them. There's something wrong there. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, local councillors are the people who decide. They are generally speaking advised by uh, their planning departments, um, and it might be that there's something wrong there too. Um, and I think it's uh, quite hard for some elected councillors. I mean, there's some who are very expert and uh, have a lot of knowledge, but many, you know, don't have a lot of knowledge, and uh, they should be advised by really first-rate planning departments. And uh, I think there is a whole generation of people in planning departments who perhaps are not doing what the public want them to do. There was a question just over here. If we could just wait for the microphone to come, that would be... Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, the vacation and the staycation, astonishing upturn in visits. Could you tell us a little more um, about this recent phenomenon? Well, if I really fully understood it, I would resign my position at English Heritage and become a multi-millionaire operator of visitor attractions because um, it is a very, very big change that is happening to the whole uh, domestic leisure market. Uh, and it's caused by a quite a large number of factors, not all of which we fully understand. Um, the pound was very strong against the euro for a very long time. Pound is now not strong against the euro. It's very expensive to go abroad. You know, a beer costs you sort of two pounds sixty, and that's a little bottle like that, not a big one. Um, so it's expensive to go abroad. Uh, I think there's a lot of anxiety about economic situation, uh, VAT, tax, unemployment, pensions, and public sector. You know, all sorts of things are happening. People, people's leisure patterns have fundamentally changed in the last three years, and. The first year it happened, we thought it was a one-off. Uh, the second year, we thought this might be here to stay, and we are in it for a third year. And it definitely looks like it's going to stay. And I think that particularly National Trust and English Heritage are going to benefit from this because uh, the membership schemes are just tearing away. I mean, the recruitment for both organizations. I had a drink with Fiona Reynolds, my opposite number at the National Trust, last night, and we were both just staggered by the rate of recruitment. And it's a very, uh, you know, it, part of it, I think, is um, back to the 1980s levels of interest in heritage, but I think it is also um, due to economic factors. I mean, I went with my family to Chatham Historic Dockyard. It cost us 50 quid to get in, for family to get in for, for one afternoon. For less than that, you could join either English Heritage or the National Trust and get in free to hundreds of sites for an entire year. So there's a real value um, issue there that I think is... Um, that is very important. But as far as I'm concerned, um, long may it last. Um, just a question at the back there. Um, in terms of political climate, uh, how do you think that's affected trade skills? And in particular, now the push towards Green Deal and the use of new technologies and the requirement for new skills yeah. in, the, in the industries? 
Well, um, there is, there is, obviously, craft skills are um, reflective of the amount of work that is available. Um, and there is no doubt that uh, in some areas there are really serious and severe shortages of people who can do certain types of craft skill. Um, in other areas, particularly in wealthy areas, uh, there are quite a lot of people who can do it because there still is quite a lot of money around and there still are enough people who are determined either determined to restore their buildings properly or have been forced by local authorities and English heritage to do their buildings properly um, to maintain these um, areas. Um, but it is something that uh, one needs to be ever vigilant about. There is almost um, a permanent retirement time bomb. Uh, the people who do this tend to be older um, and they retire and there's always a great anxiety about how are you going to recruit a young man um, into doing, you know, creating plaster ceilings like this. Uh, by some miracle, we do just about manage to do it. But craft skills will always remain a very, very big concern. Um, and it isn't at the fashionable end, as you, as you rightly say, it's not at the fashionable end of, of, of training. Uh, English Heritage does put a lot of money, a lot of effort into trying to make sure it's recognised. But as I say, we have to be vigilant. I've just one more question here at the front. I'm, I'm Could you just wait for the microphone so that... I'll... Historical political overview since, since the war, really, which you referred to, don't you think that largely it's dictated by ideology rather than money? For instance, the Labour Party in 1945 um, had less money than the Tory government now, but they passed a great deal of heritage, and including the creation of civic um, civic uh, orchestras and as well as buildings and things and that was continued by new labor to a certain extent and now some people would say that the big society um, going back to local people is going back to an elitist system rather than a system for a wider mass mm. audience mm. is that too simple a view well, I don't know. I mean, what I would say is that I think you should see the um, creation of the listing system, a lot of that legislation, and the 1947 um, Town and Country Planning Act, as part of that massive um, post-war um, nationalisation of, of, you know, of state activity. Um, and so... I mean, this, I was uh, invited to speak to one of the summer schools this morning, and I actually used the word that the government effectively nationalised history um, in the 1940s. I mean, the business of taking over the listing of buildings and the government um, henceforth deciding, you know, which historic buildings were going to be accepted as history and which ones were not going to be accepted as history. And if you were accepted as history, well, you'd be preserved in the future. If you were not, you'd be knocked down. And therefore in another 50 years' time, the way that uh, my children, when they're you know, my age, will see the world will be fundamentally conditioned by decisions that were taken by the government as to what bits of our history are going to survive. So I see it as all part of the sort of big sort of nationalisation that went on. And, and this government are talking, you know, about the privatisation of all these ac activities. Um, and you know, the possibility that you don't need an organization like English Heritage. You can just uh, say that you, you're going to license an architect, uh, and uh, an architect would decide whether a building was worth, worthy of saving or not. And if he made a decision that people disagree with, he might lose his license to practice. So I think you're right in the fact that there is a pendulum that's swinging, um, and the system we're in now is, you know, a, you know, has come out, came out of the Second World War, like the nationalisation of the railways, or the nationalisation of the canals, or the nationalisation of uh, the steel industry. There will be different types of utopia. Yeah, there exactly. Of utopia. Yeah, completely agree with you. Well, perhaps on the mention of utopia, we should draw <laughs> things to a, a close. Um, many of us, all of us here, perhaps Simon, have, have actually lived through the period that you've been talking about and have seen these things, but perhaps not quite with the detachment and overview that you've managed to, to bring to it tonight. I've certainly learned a huge amount about things that were going on in my own lifetime that I perhaps wasn't 
as conscious of, of as you've made me tonight. So um, we're incredibly grateful to you for spending the time to come and talk to us from your great experience and expertise. And I have to say, I'm sure that everybody here wishes you and English Heritage well with managing the difficult times ahead so that we will come out uh, stronger and uh, better prepared to uh, forward the uh, aims that we all share uh, beyond this, uh, this period of, um, of economic hardship. So thank you, Simon Thurley, very much indeed. So thank you, Frank, for chairing this evening, and of course, um, great thanks to you, Simon. That's clearly from the number of questions, a hugely stimulating um, talk this evening. And as a small token of our thanks, um, there's a, a gift for you here, which gives the history of Maddingley Hall and the gardens. Um, so something to thanks. read on your way home. Thank, thank you very much. Um, of course, it goes without saying that um, events such as these don't happen um, by themselves, so a great deal of thanks um, is extended to my colleagues, without whom we wouldn't be here tonight. Um, also, I'd like to um, hope that we'll see many of you back here at Maddingley Hall in the future, not only for um, subsequent Maddingley lectures or perhaps Maddingley concerts, but also to study with us. Um, there are brochures of our courses in the upcoming term on your seats, and there are other brochures outside on the gallery for you to pick up. Um, and I hope that there'll be something there that will catch your imagination. Um, we certainly have an awful lot to catch your imagination. We have um, about 8,000 to 10,000 student enrolments per year, ranging from short, non-credit-bearing courses through to accredited undergraduate level and postgraduate programs, part-time master's degrees, in subject areas for personal intellectual enrichment and also for professional development and diversification, as well as the international summer schools, which Simon mentioned, um, that bring well over 1,000 people from over 60 countries worldwide to Cambridge each year. And we've just come to the end of our first week of the summer schools, which extend for the next five weeks um, for this year. Our latest uh, part-time master's degree, which we formally launched yesterday evening, is in building history. And this has been developed with the Faculty of Architecture and History of Art, so with um, Frank and Frank's colleagues, and in close association with English Heritage, so with Simon's um, colleagues. Um, there are leaflets for our new Masters in Building History out on the gallery, also to pick up, as well as our certificate in um, Building History Conservation. So all in all, um, we're doing our bit to share Cambridge as widely as possible and to transform lives. So you'll be very welcome back here at Maddingley Hall, whether for um, a public lecture or to study with us. So thank you for coming, and um, it's a lovely evening, so if you don't have to rush off, um, our bar is open downstairs, and the gardens are free for you to explore. So thank you very much. Thank you.